Hi guys, it's Monique here with the Berean Disciples YouTube channel and Facebook post screening of Bible study and podcast. Got a lot going on over here lately. Today we will be continuing our study. Uh, we're in James chapter four and we're going to be dealing with verses four through five today. And I titled this a call a call to repentance. Now in our last study, we, we learned about particular uh, petitions I guess you would call this because I don't call them prayers. So I'm changing the words here that, that James says, God is not hearing. He literally says you have not because you ask not. And if you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. And so James is clarifying here that there are some things, some petitions. I don't call them necessarily prayers because the motives behind them are, are wrong. Uh, and James is saying that there are some things that, that as believers, we're just not going to get answered. God's not dealing with certain things that believe that believers put before him. And I want us to note that I'm using the word petition and not prayers. When Jesus says in Matthew 7, ask and it shall be given to you, um, according to this commentary and just wisdom, if you are reading the scripture, he has in mind an asking in which the focus and motives glorify God's name, the kingdom, and God's will. This is not a selfish type of asking. God is not a sugar daddy bestowing gifts simply because we want them for our own enjoyment or for social media posts so we can say hashtag bless and hide the favor. That's not what's happening. That's not what's going on. Most people's desires to achieve have nothing to do with God and everything to do with their own selfish ambitions and their worldly recognition. They're seeking to be admired by men. They are not seeking by man. So when I say by man, men and women are seeking to be admired by other men and women. They're looking for followers themselves. They're not looking to glorify God. And James clarified, he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your own pleasures. That's where we ended in our last study. Notice that he, he begins by saying you will not receive. You will not receive. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know I'm not the only uh, one who has been uh, who has pushed past no. And when I say push past no, um, there are things in my past or in my in my life with my decision making, my horrible decision making uh, from my past where I would get clear no's. So these are not things that I'm receiving from God. There are things that I push past uh, God's clear roadblock, his clear no. Because I, I wanted what I what I was requesting or I wanted what I desired. So my requests, uh, they were always driven purely uh, by my own selfish motives and I would push past no. So I have, I've looked back in awe that I put myself in such extreme situations for foolishness. One such instance that remains before my mind was the desire for a, a certain vehicle that I did not need. Honestly, I did not need it and I, and I couldn't afford it. I, I recently graduated from college and I'd already had a car that was paid for, right? I had a car that was paid for. It was like a, it looked like a Malibu, but it was actually a cutlass. So it was made on this, in this odd style that these cars looked like the same exact car. And they may be from the same dealer. I don't know. Uh, but it was a newer model for that time frame. Um, and it, it looked just like a Malibu, but it was, it was a cutlass. Um, so I wanted a new car. I had just graduated from college. I hadn't even taken my, so I went to school to be a, a, be a nurse. I hadn't taken my boards. I did not have anything secured. Uh, but I, what I did do was I took my, uh, the fact that I just graduated and I went to one of the, the nursing homes in the area that was hiring. And they would allow you to get hired on as a, as a student nurse, even though you had finished the program, but you were in the midst, you know, in the middle of, waiting to take the board. So they will hire you on and they will give you a lesser rate to come and work while you waited to take the boards. And so that's what I did. I had no money. Uh, and the only way I would get the full nursing salary was if I passed uh, the exam. And I was told by everybody, y'all. I was told by everybody. I was told by my grandfather. I was told by my father. I was told by every single person 
that I talked to about this car because I did have the wherewithal to go talk to someone about it. I was told by every one of them, do not pay, don't buy this car. Everybody and their mama said, don't buy this car. You have a car that is already paid for and you do not necessarily have a nursing job <laughs> yet. You haven't finished. So don't buy this car. Okay. Clear nose. I didn't, I didn't pray about it. I didn't pray about it because at that time I was still living so foolishly running away from the church because I felt that I had early release for good behavior. Okay. I was running away from the church. So I did not pray about it. I just asked the people around me because I thought they would be like, sure, you, you deserve it. Cause that's, I had in my mind that I deserved something. I hadn't worked for anything yet, apart from the, the piece of paper that I got that said I could go out and practice nursing. But I thought, you know, I deserved that car. And so I wanted it. And so I did it anyway. I went and I traded in my paid for car to be upside down in a car because I wanted it. And I was upside down. And if you understand upside down in those payments, I mean, the car, the amount that I owe was not... The car wasn't worth the amount that I owed. And I suffered for years with that car. I suffered for years with that car. I did not, um, again, I did not ask God. But God made his will known to me through many people. Many people said, do not buy that car. Don't buy it. I did not need a car. It was all selfish desire. There was no glorification of God in, in that in many decisions at that time. I, I just felt like I deserved it. I graduated from college, so I deserve a new car and I got just what I deserved. Just what I deserved. Uh, difficulty, hard times, and I didn't learn the first time. I did not. I was impacted by the world. I mean, I was looking around me. People had such nice things. I wanted nice things. And man, I put myself in a very, very bad place for something that ended up not even being nice to me. I wanted to get rid of it so bad, but I couldn't. And James says a clear warning to believers to not be driven by their emotions and desires to seek pleasure. That's, that's not what we are to be out here. That's not the driving force in the believer's life. The driving force in the believer's life, life is the word of God, aligning with that word. So today we're going to be beginning at verse four and James writes there, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Why is he saying this? Because the world is driven by their emotions and their desires. That's the only thing that drives the people of the world. And maybe other things, of course, there are other things. But lots of the, the, the driving force behind what someone wants to achieve comes from their own personal desires. But Christians aren't to align. We, we don't line up like that. We, we want the will of God. We want God's will to prevail in our lives. So he says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Other versions of this says, says that friendship with the world is, it makes you an enemy of God. It's enmity towards God. Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's a wild moment in the scripture. Literally something is happening there. And many people like to conflate this and say, oh, well, this means you can't have friends who are not Christian. No, that's not what it means. Or uh, having friends, it, it means something. You are to impact those people, but you are to be Christian and impact those people. What you can't do is have friends who you act like and then come over here and pretend with God. So I want to point out that James is talking to believers. I want to make sure we understand that this is a this is scripture being written to believers. And I have to say this because believers will take this sacred text and, and tell it to unbelievers as if they can follow it. They can't follow it. Our ability to be able to follow it comes from the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And Christ is James here is writing and God, the Father, the Son and the Spirit empowers us to be able to live this out. They are the world that's being spoken of in this portion of scripture. 
Yes, they're working out their job description. I like to say that. They know their job. They're working it out, okay? We as believers need to work out ours. So this is not evangelism language. This is instruction for believers. Now, let, let's look at how James starts the sentence. He says, you adulteresses. He says, hey, believer, hey, person that Christ died for, hey, slave of God, what are you doing cheating with this world? He calls us cheaters if this is how we live. This double-minded action is not something that God looks upon favorably. Christ has already purchased you. Why are you cheating with Satan? Because there are only two things here. I know we like to think there are, there are other ways of doing things, but there, according to the scripture, there are only two roads. Now, down that wide road, they have all these different categories that they've, you know, that they've placed down here. You know, all these different religions, all these different beliefs, but they all lead to one place. So as believers, we believe that there are only two options here. There are only two, right? So let us be perfectly clear about what James uh, means when he says friendship with the world. The prince of this world is Satan. That's why I say you're cheating. Why are you cheating with Satan? Right? The prince of this world is Satan. You are not your own. Even the unsaved don't belong to themselves. They think they do. And I mean, that's exactly what Satan wants you to believe is that you've made a decision that benefits you and you alone. Uh, and that you it's just it's just the selfishness that you have for yourself. It's a desire that you have for yourself. It's your own will. Ultimately, what he understands is there are only two ways. He doesn't care if you pick one of the many alternatives that he gives over here by way of false religion. What he's, what, what he's saying is that it's, it, it doesn't make you happy. It's about you. Choosing not to follow God means you choose by default to follow Satan. So you are, this is an, this is an adulterous relationship and the unsaved is participating in a relationship with Satan. They're not participating in a relationship with God. Right. But believers, we're being told, don't go over here flirting around, messing around over there. And so James is using marriage language here because this is the language used to describe a relationship between Christ and his church. And the church is believers, it's not a building. Believers are in a covenant relationship with Christ. Therefore, there could be no friendship or alignment with the world. And what this means is this act of flirting, this active double-mindedness, this active, this is not I fall down, as believers will do. This is a willful partaking of sin and sinful behavior on a regular basis that is not, there's no conviction, there is no change, there is no, we are doing the same things that other people in the world are doing. We're just calling ourselves believers, and that's not that doesn't align with scripture. James is saying here uh, that this type of friendship with the world or alignment with the world is not of God. This, this spiritual adultery lands believers in a situation where they seek to maintain competing relationships. It's a competing relationship. All we need to do to understand uh, why this fails is just to look at what happens under circumstances when dealing with, I mean, in the natural world, when we're seeing people dealing with spouses uh, who cheat or commit commit adultery, look at what happens in the natural world. You fully understand why you can't have two competing, this is not going to work, two competing relationships. It doesn't work. And that's why the marriage language is actually quite perfect for the situation. Eventually, what happens is they will be found out. Uh, because they they will change. You change. I don't care how good, and there are some people who are very good at hiding uh, that they are cheating. There are some people that are very, very good and manipulative. But over time, people change. You will be changed by those actions. You It's, it's not easy to, to kind of juggle multiple relationships at one time, especially personal, private, uh, intimate relationships. 
So they, they, they'll begin to change over time or either they or the third person will desire total commitment because that's, that's our nature. We desire monogamy, right? We desire this, this committed relationship here. And you can't have that if someone is openly, even in these relationships where we see today where people are saying, well, I have an open marriage. That's usually one selfish spouse desire. And the other spouse goes along with it in an effort to kind of have a, I don't know what they think they're going to get out of that, but in an effort to kind of have some kind of unity amongst them, they're going to be united, all right, with other people. But it doesn't work because there's a natural jealousy that's produced because that's my person. I'm that person's, I'm his person, he's my person. And those things ultimately lead to failure because for that same reason, for that very reason. There will be a desire for total commitment amongst these people. There are undoubtedly other reasons that that they could be found out. Sometimes people are careless. It's hard to hold these competing ideas. We see this all throughout scripture where these things are called Uh, double-mindedness and what God does with double-mindedness. We see that in the book of Revelation where it says he spews that you be be hot or cold. You ain't going to be lukewarm and not in between. He's not interested in in the in-between. There are undoubtedly other reasons, as I said, that people can be found out. Um, However, all these things are are also true to a relationship with Christ. A double-minded Half-hearted effort will not do. Will believers fall short? Yes, God knows that. However, believers are characterized by confession and repentance. When they fall short, they confess and they repent. And why do they confess and repent? Most people think it is this, I got to straighten it all out or I got to turn around. It's this legalistic uh, thing that believers do. Do, but that's not what happens. There is a conviction, a true conviction on the inside of the heart of believers for falling short. We fully grasp and understand that Christ went to the cross on behalf of our sins. Now we're still continuing to live in these sins. And there's a genuine conviction. We're we're not, we should not be still living in these sins, but when we fall short, there's a conviction. We don't desire to ruin our relationship with God. We desire to maintain it, to persevere. And so believers are characterized by confession and repentance, not accepting and living willfully and unconfessed and and unrepentant sin. When you see people living willfully and and, and unconfessed, I mean, they're not ashamed. They're, they're, it's not, they, they are actually quite prideful about the fact that they're living. That, that is, I don't care what they say out of their mouth. That's not Christian behavior that does not align with the scripture. Are they new to Christianity or could they be growing in Christianity? But if this is your lifestyle, you're not a Christian. And that's according to the word of God, not me. This is a sign that you are an enemy to God, according to scripture. What does James say? You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So friendship is hostility. You are, you, you're mucking around right there. You're just meddling around. Therefore, if you are a friend of the world, you are you're, you're on that fast track of making yourself an enemy with uh, an enemy to God. And verse five says, or, or do you think that the scripture says uh, to no purpose, meaning that it doesn't have a purpose behind it, it's just just saying something. He jealously desires the spirit whom he has made to dwell in us. He's seeking that spirit to not only dwell in us, but to be exuded. It's it's to overflow in us. It's to come out, to be seen in us. The purpose of the scripture is so believers can know God and his will. We must remember James would have been referring to the Old Testament scripture again. This is why the Old Testament is so rich in this book, in this letter that James is writing. Uh, Chronological studies suggest that James was one of the first books written. 
for the New Testament. If not the first book that was added to it, it was the first book written that would be in the New Testament. Therefore, uh, the only scripture James could be referring to at this point is the Old Testament scripture. James is ultimately suggesting that uh, the Old Testament scripture is essential to Christians. We need to know it. Right. And this is the polar opposite of what we see today. I see uh, so-called pastors like Andy Stanley, who's uh, something else. This is Charles Stanley's son. Um, and he says different things today. Like he, he makes statements um, that says we should separate completely. That believers should separate completely from the Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. And in my opinion, that is ludicrous. That is that is that's crazy. I believe the New Testament because of the Old Testament. The Christ in the New Testament is testified uh, to in the Old Testament. So how will we dispense with the Old Testament? It doesn't make any sense at all. In verse five, uh, where it says again, or do you do, or do you think that the Scripture says to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit with whom He has made dwell in us. In that verse, we continue to see this marriage language. James says, God jealously desires the spirit whom he has made to dwell in us. Now, I remember hearing Oprah went for one time on her show. I didn't, I didn't see it in real time. Of course, I was very little during that time. I was only born in 1981, so I would have been very young and not watching Oprah Winfrey because she wasn't a favorite of my grandmother. So I remember seeing clips uh, throughout time now. I've seen clips of her suggesting that uh, the reason that that she disbelieved certain things in the scripture, as if you can disbelieve parts of the scripture. But she says the reason I disbelieve is because God, God is jealous of me. I thought when I heard her say that, I just thought to myself, jealous of you. I mean, the mere men and their ability to see themselves as having grandiose ideas can be, I mean, can be, can just blow you away. The fact that she took this to me, that God is jealous of her, not jealous for her. I was blown away that that was where she arrived at and she continues to be there, it seems this. It seems like she continues to stay there. This means he does not desire the spirit of, st of Satan to be produced in this. He says jealous, he jealously, God jealously desires the spirit whom he has made to dwell in us. This means he doesn't desire the spirit that this world produces in the natural man, the spirit of this world, which is Satan. When we see believers uh, as having a covenant relationship with God, we can better understand the seriousness this is a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant, right? When we see believers having a covenant relationship with God, we can then understand the seriousness of flirting with the world. We don't go out and flirt with the world. If you're married, you understand we don't go out and flirt with the world. You, we're not winking our eye at the world. The mind of the believer is to be moved into a allegiance with God and his people over time. And how do we get there? We're totally aligned when we are in, 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 in our natural selves, when we are our natural selves, sinners. We're totally aligned with the world and we've had plenty of time to practice it. But as believers, of course, we need, we need time to practice this new thing, right? And there is a studying of scripture and prayer and worship and fellowship and accountability. I mean, you get into Bible believing churches amongst other believers who want to see that change in you, that transformation that only God produces in you because he desires all believers to live out that spirit he is called to dwell on the inside of them. He desires that spirit for the believer. He doesn't just want them to profess, hey, I'm a believer. They are to be believers. It's, a, it's an action. You act it out. And it's not an acting. It's who you are. Over time, this, this, the belief, the practice of this belief becomes who you are. 
you are a Christian. So this is a call to action for believers. They need, we need to take inventory of our lives, not in light of a pastor's word, not in light of what the world says Christians need to be. You need to be nice. I'm definitely not nice all the time. Not in light of my words or anyone else's word, but in light of God's word. What does God say a believer is? Who does God say a believer is? Does this align with the, with the life that I'm living if I'm calling myself a believer? That's what we need to do. Check ourselves against ourselves in light of God's word. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you. Thanking you for allowing us to get up from our beds this morning and start us out on our way, Lord God. Lord, we worship you, your son, and your spirit for the work you continue to do in and through us. Lord God, we want more than anything to go out into the world and be Christian, be who you called us to be. And let us proceed because we've studied the scripture. We know the word. Let us be bold Christians who declare your word to a dying world. Lord God, if there's any sin in our hearts, in our minds, our lives, we ask that you make that clear for us, Lord God. That we may confess and repent by the power of your spirit and no longer continue in opposition to you in your word, in your way. Lord, we pray for our children as we send them out into the world. We pray that you cover them and you keep them, Lord God, and that you place believers before them, Lord God, who will say what your word says. We pray for the country in which we live in. We pray for people who are struggling with sickness, financial issues, whatever it may be, Lord, that they recognize that you are a provider, Lord. We pray for the people who are in positions of power, that they will be saved, Lord God. We pray for salvation for them, that they come to a full understanding that they are living in opposition to you if they are, and that they confess and repent, no longer continuing in sin that separates them from you. These things we pray in your son Jesus' matchless name. Amen. All righty, people, don't let the discussion end here. Please tell me in the comment section what you think about uh, today's study, what you think about any study. You like it, you don't like it. Hey, I take the likes as well as the dislikes. I understand that that's a part of it. Um, also, I'll be thinking about where we go next, where we go next. Remember on Wednesdays, last week was Thursdays, but once a week we do a podcast here where we discuss things that are happening or occurring in the world in light of the scripture. So I will see you guys the next time. Please tell someone about the goodness of Jesus Christ and make sure you are reading your Bible. Bye-bye.